Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, child witnesses and how to proceed in a case where um, the child experienced something and you want to use their testimony or, or their perspective one way or another. Um, so initially you're going to have to determine whether you want the child in your case to testify. Um, some of the factors that you'd want to consider are, of course, the age. Um, there's no like bright line cutoff date, and that's going to depend on um, your county's practice and also the preference of the individual judge. Some judges almost never want to have children testify. Some judges always want to hear from the children. A lot of them are somewhere in between or you know, some judges have it in their head that like, you know, there's a certain magical age after which they want to hear from the child, but not before. Um, you'll have to decide if there is any um, evidence that's necessary to your case that can only be entered um, via the child's testimony or statements. Um, you know, sometimes the evidence that you need to, you know, let's say there was, um, you know, somebody hit the child, but if there was an adult witness who observed what happened, then, you know, you may not actually need the child's testimony. Um, so it depends, you have to really look at like, what is it that you're looking to have admitted? Um, if you, um, if you're finding that um, the child is, let's say that you're trying to argue that the child is fearful of the other party in a custody case, that's something that you may have to have the child testify about um, unless uh, there's another tool that you can use um, and we'll get into what some of those are. Um, You'll want to consider the emotional trauma and the nature of the testimony. Um, you know, depending on how serious the abuse was um, or the type of abuse, it, it may be extremely difficult um, for the child to testify. And it, it could be that, you know, nobody involved wants to make them do that. Um, and so, you know, if there is something that the only the child has personal knowledge of that you want to have entered into evidence. Um, you'll have to determine whether there is some alternative means of entering the child's statements um, and whether that might be just as effective. Um, so some of the things that we might use to get child testimony in without actually having the child testify um, one might be the testimony of the uh, CYS caseworker. Um, now, if there is a situation where, for instance, um, uh, an investigation resulted in an indicated status, um, the CYS caseworker may be able to testify to that effect and to the reasons why uh, generally the indicated status um, was assigned to that case. Um, different caseworkers in different counties are gonna have different amounts of leeway in terms of what they're willing and able to discuss in the, in the courtroom. Um, and also depending on which solicitor is with them. Um, but generally they, the court will give them a lot of leeway. Um, I mean, I've certainly see, seen them testify to, uh, to a lot of things that are hearsay um, without typically getting much of an objection from the other side, but I don't know if that's, you know, specific to Luzerne County. Um, you can ask for a guardian ad litem to be appointed. Um, and in that case, um, it's the practice is going to depend on your county as to whether um, a guardian ad litem is available. Um, I'm sorry, as to whether an IFP is available for a guardian ad litem. Um, some counties do have an IFP uh, fee waiver for a GAL, such as I know Lackawanna does. Uh, Luzerne County does not. Um, and the rate 
in Luzerne County recently increased to $75 an hour. And it's normally apportioned between the clients 50-50, um, but that is cost prohibitive to most of our clients. Um, there are certain circumstances where you can ask for the other party to be liable for um, the GAL fees. Um, I know I recently had a custody case where I had multiple contempt petitions against the other party. Um, and it was a situation where it was very egregious contempt and it was repeated. Um, and in that case, I was able to get the court to order the other party to pay the entire GAL fee. Um, but if there's no IFP in your county, you do have to determine whether your client would be able to come up with the funds. Now, the guardian ad litem will interview the child um, and they'll issue a report and recommendation to the court. And most of the GAL reports um, that I've gotten in my cases have been pretty detailed as to the child's perspective. Um, so that can be a really good way to kind of get their perspective um, before the court without having them come and testify. Um, and then another option, and this is something that I'll frequently use when the client cannot afford a guardian ad litem, um, but it's been getting more difficult lately, and that's um, some kind of family counseling. Um, you can request individual counseling for the child or any party or all the parties in a case or family counseling. Usually in a custody case, it's some form of family counseling, although they'll meet individually um, with the child and uh, the adult parties um, before they start doing joint sessions um, between different parties. And the counselor will typically be ordered to submit a report to the court um, regarding you know, what the issues are. Um, and sometimes uh, they even make a recommendation, uh, sort of like what a guardian ad litem would do. Um, sometimes in cases um, where family counseling is recommended and useful, there might be some sort of history of either uh, physical abuse or even just uh, emotional or verbal abuse um, of the child by one of the parents. And you can use um, a counseling report in that case uh, if it perhaps recommends suspending or just limiting contact with the other party. Um, sometimes the counselor will recommend that they have only therapeutic contact for now or that there is a supervisor around. Um, and that can be helpful to have in place until the relationship is repaired or until the adverse party you know, does what they need to do. Um, I know in uh, Luzerne County, the, the judge does want you to have the name of a counselor ready. Um, you know, if you don't, it's not the end of the world. Um, they'll either say, you know, a counselor that the parties agree on, um, or they might suggest or appoint somebody. Um, but then the issue with that is if they pick somebody out, you don't know if they're going to accept your client's insurance um, or whatever insurance the child has. So if I'm going to ask for counseling to be part of a case, um, I will typically find out what kind of insurance the client and child have. It's usually MA and then you're, you know, pretty limited in terms of, you know, which places you might, uh, places or counselors you might ask to be assigned to the case. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the other option would be to admit the child's statements via another witness or a recording, um, such as a CAC interview. Um, but hopefully you have something that's easier to get than that um, under a hearsay exception. And um, so some of the hearsay exceptions that commonly apply in cases like this are um, excited utterance, um, a then existing mental, emotional, or physical condition, um, a statement, especially in abuse cases, a statement made for medical diagnosis or treatment, um, records of a regularly conducted activity, or um, under the tender years doctrine, which is 
not part of the rules of evidence. It's a separate statute and um, it can get pretty involved and there've been some recent changes to it. So we're gonna talk about it right now. Um, the first thing to know is that until recently, it only applied to um, children who at the time the statement was made were 12 years of age or younger. Um, it was only just uh, about a year ago that uh, an amendment to the statute went into effect that changes that age to 16. Um, so that really broadens the cases where, um, where the tender years doctrine can be used to admit here's otherwise hearsay testimony. Um, so in order for the tender years doctrine to apply, the court has to find that um, the evidence that's being sought to be uh, admitted is relevant, um, that the time, the content, and the circumstances of the statement uh, provide a sufficient in indicia of reliability, um, and that the child either does testify at the proceeding um, or is unavailable as a witness. Now, the key to the tender years doctrine is that the child doesn't actually have to be unavailable in the way that um, you might think based on the plain language. Um, under the tender years doctrine, the court can find that the child is unavailable because of the emotional trauma of testifying about what happened. Um, and so historically, the tender years doctrine was used um, in order to admit testimony relating to uh, cases involving sexual abuse, um, although that is not um, not necessarily um, the case. Um, it is um, there are a number of offenses that are listed in the statute. Um, and sexual offenses are included, but assault is also included. And so physical abuse is um, certainly a situation that opens itself up to the tender years doctrine. Um, it just depends upon the, you know, the severity of the abuse, right? Like you're going to have to show that the child actually is um, so distressed by testifying about what happened so, so as to make them essentially unavailable to testify during the court proceeding. Um, and of course, that's not going to be easy to do if it's a less serious case of physical abuse. Um, I mean, um, what about a situation where there's, you know, 10 to years doctrine, there was a statement made by a child, say six months ago, that daddy was, you know, touching me. Um, and then at the hearing, the child contradicts that testimony and testifies that daddy never touched me. What do we do in that kind of a situation? Or is that up to the judge to make a determination of what's more credible? I mean, I think in that case, the judge has to make the determination. Um, you know, the bright side about that case, if there is one, is that the child is testifying already. So you don't have to show that they're unavailable in order to um, have their have evidence of their prior testimony admitted under the tender years doctrine, right? So like anybody who witnessed the prior statement where they um, disclosed the abuse is is going to be able to testify about that because the child is available to testify. Right. Um, you know, assuming of course that the judge, you know, finds that other requirements are met about credibility at the time the statement was made. So I think then, you know, the hard part for you would be trying to show that the statement that was made by the child previously was more reliable than the one that was just made now. I mean, if there's a difference in the custodial situation and that the alleged perpetrator has had access to the child in the interim, that might help. And also just the passage of time. I mean, six months is a long time for a young child, right? Right. Um, so, um, 
the attorney for um, I'm sorry, the attorney for um, the defendant or well, in a civil proceeding, the attorney for the plaintiff has the right to be present um, when the court is questioning the child to determine, you know, the extent of their emotional distress to determine if they are in fact um, unavailable. Um, And um, notice has to be required, um, advanced notice has to be required. If you plan on um, using this testimony, uh, using testimony under the tender years doctrine, um, you have to provide notice to the other side um, that you plan on having the statement admitted um, under the tender years doctrine in order to give them the opportunity to um, respond and you know, either object to the admission or prepare um, whatever their strategy is going to be. Diana, um, yeah. Does anybody have, um, or you or anyone else have experience regarding how much notice is required? No. Um, last minute notice? Yeah. Um, I think that ultimately it's going to be up to the judge. Um, and so I would say that, you know, it's going to be highly fact dependent. Like what, it, first of all, are you dealing with the PFA or custody? I think that there's much more leeway for last minute notice in PFA cases than there is in a custody case um, because of the time frame. Uh, but it depends on where you are procedurally. Um, I'm about to find out because <laughs> I'm about to give notice to another party. Um, but yeah, in custody cases, I think that general, I mean, I know in Luzerne County with custody, usually dealing with a very long period of time prior to a hearing um, where you know that it's coming up and there's probably a little less leeway in terms of, you know, when you're giving notice. Um, you're going to have to file a motion with the court to admit the statement pursuant to the tender years doctrine. Um, and then the court is supposed to conduct a hearing to determine uh, admissibility. Um, and that's going to be up to the court's own scheduling, but like I could definitely see, especially in a PFA case, the court, you know, kind of ruling on admissibility um, at the outset and then going right into the actual PFA hearing, um, again, because of the time frame, And I think that you're less likely to necessarily have an opposing party who agrees to um, continue the matter. Um, in custody, they may want to uh, really take their time so that they can try to fight the admission of the statement under the tender years doctrine. Uh, whereas, you know, if there's a temporary PFA in place that prevents contacts between the defendant and the child, they may not want to take that same kind of time in a PFA case. Um, I mean, I think it's probably best to just try to communicate with the, hopefully there is counsel on the other side. Um, and you can communicate with them um, to try to work that out. Uh, I, I cannot imagine trying to give notice of this to a pro se litigant, but I'm, I'm sure it's gonna come up eventually. Has anybody had that? No. No. John, if, it's, if you were, I, I know if you or Steven <laughs> would be the two I would think might have come across it, but. Um, so the admissibility of the evidence is going to depend on the reliability of the child statement, um, which the judge will determine. And, and again, the unavailability of the child due to their emotional distress, which the court will also determine. 